Hello and welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth, brought to you by Grounded Press. My name is Dana Petrovic, and each week my guests and I explore one aspect of Mother Earth and the gifts that she gives us. We also discuss why these gifts are so precious and why we should value them. We got you curious? Good. We love curiosity. Let's begin. Today, we are talking about a nurturing topic in the real sense of the world, Mother Earth's soil. For many of us, soil might be only dirt under our feet and the cause of getting irritated if our hands, our feet, our shoes got, get dirty. Yet, that same soil under our feet is where our food grows. And that dirt, dirt is also a home to millions and millions of organisms hidden in a whole ecosystem underneath the soil's surface. Dear listeners, you and I don't need to research this in great detail as there are thankfully experts who have already done this or are doing this like my today's guest. This allows us to simply value those who know how to sustain and nourish the soil, so its health and its ecosystem, and thus at the same time, the quality of our food. This allows us to simply enjoy every single bite of food that connects us directly to the soil and the country where the plant grew. My today's guest is Professor Nancy Karanja, who has dedicated much of her career researching our soil and its health. The list of her accomplishments is so long that it would fill the whole podcast alone. I will stick to the, her most important findings and invite you, dear listeners, to reach out if you want to know more. Nancy is a full professor of, in soil ecology and the director of Microbial Resource Center at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. She has committed much of her time to urban agriculture and its role in addressing food insecurity and livelihoods for the urban poor. She was the Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Coordinator for Urban Harvest, an initiative to enhance urban agriculture's potential and food security in Kenya. I first found Nancy through a nonprofit organization called One Acre Fund, where she was listed as one of top researchers in this field. Professor Karanja, welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth. Thank you very much for Godana for having me. And I'm very happy that you're coming in with a topic that is very dear to my heart. Thank you very much. Very, very pleased to have you. Nancy, you have personally researched what is happening underground in that dark place where we put the tiny tender seeds that will eventually open, pierce the surface and become made mature plants. My listeners who have gardens or even just indoor plants have seen this miracle of life unfolding. I would say that you are not only researching soil, but rather life in all its beauty. Tell our listeners about the diversity hidden from us beneath our feet. What happens there? Uh, I will introduce it the way I teach my first year students. Because the way to appreciate life in the soil is first to describe what is a soil. Indeed, soil has five different components. And the most precious and the most interesting is what we've been told about life in the soil. 
And indeed, if you remove it, and that is what we are doing now by destroying, by polluting, you do not have a soil, what it is supposed to be. It becomes just a material that we soil biologists describe as sand, which is very important, of course, to engineers. Life in the soil is very complex. And as you have heard, it is dark, it's compact. There's no highways, we can't move around. And therefore, it is not that easy to say exactly or to see these small organisms. The diversity is very big. In fact, life in the soil is bigger than what you see on the surface, what we call terrestrial world or the marine world where we are. At least wow. lucky to see some of the big organisms. Incredible. However, yeah, it's incredible. In the soil, however, in the soil, you also find big animals. I would give snakes, rats, anteaters, because these ones we can identify ourselves with, we see them. But also they are the microscopic organisms, including what I'm you will now understand because we are going through a very difficult time the whole globally, the viruses. They are also found in the soil. So I won't say anything about the number because there are millions and millions of organisms from viruses, bacteria, fungi, algae, what we describe as microscopic. We have also worms. And I think all, most of us, especially farmers, appreciate earthworms, ants, termites, which, all of which have a job and a task to do. And they are part of what makes the world beautiful. And we appreciate that beauty. Above the ground, we may not understand what goes on below the ground. That's the answer that I could give in a very simple, simple manner that most of us will understand. Let me add something that the farmer will appreciate. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. always tell my young people, if we did not have organisms in the soil, which do a very big task of cleaning the earth, then I always say, I'm, I tell people, imagine how the world would look like. Litter everywhere. The forest would be covered by, by, by litter, leaves. There would be nothing decaying so you can just imagine what kind of a life we'd be leading that's that is what they do to us that's interesting that you mentioned it because we talked about um, the little helpers in a previous episode when we talked about bugs and of course we talked about ants and we talked uh, all of all of these who are doing a great job for us for supporting us in so many ways so it's it's um, again we are coming of course back to this because everything is connected and you mentioned worms. The funny story is that my book, Vanna's Adventure what, with Mother Earth, was inspired by an episode of me showing a rainworm to a group of children. And the early action was, yuck! Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, all of these, as rightfully said, all of them have a role to play, no matter how tiny they are. That's very nicely put. And of course, in this, in, in this um, diversity, this incredible diversity, as you said, more than life on the surface or in the seas, which is mind boggling. There's also something that we kind of consider negative uh, because we emit a lot, lots of it into the atmosphere, which is carbon. Carbon is everywhere. We talk about carbon a lot, but carbon is necessary for life under the surface and actually very welcome there. So correct me if I'm wrong, but is there more carbon in soil than also in all plants and the atmosphere above? Yes, you're right. The total carbon globally about Above 80, almost 90% of carbon is held in the soil. And we use a very complex word, sequestration. It is held in the soil in forms 
that sometimes are readily available, broken down by the same organisms I've talked about to release nutrients. And there are some that are held for thousands of years. They are the ones that retain what we describe as a good soil and they don't decay quickly. Pit bogs, they are, they are part of, of systems or ecosystems that actually hold carbon for us. And they make those systems very stable. And we know what is happening, particularly in the Chadra or in the, in the, in the Northern countries where already because of climate change, the bogs or the pit bogs are starting to break down. Yeah. And there's already a worry. Yeah. So carbon, is essential, the soil is the major global storage for carbon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's... yeah. And, and I would like to add that uh, we shouldn't have a negative kind of image of carbon. It is through human activity that we have upset the balance of carbon. The way the world was made, it was balanced. And carbon we know is very critical. Without carbon, there's no food mm -hmm. because it's through the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is fixed and made into carbohydrates, into sugars. Mm -hmm. So carbon is not negative, carbon is life. Your own body is carbon. So without carbon, you are not there also. There is no life. There's no life. Mm -hmm. Carbon is what we refer, we refer to organic. Without carbon, there's no organic. Mm -hmm. So carbon should not be seen in a negative way. Yeah. Carbon is positive, but let us, we human beings, come out and solve the issue of the negativity of carbon in life. Yeah, yeah we, have to, we have to resolve how to put less of that into the atmosphere. Yeah. We have yeah. to find, we have to go back to the balance where carbon is welcome, like in soil or you know, within the plant world yeah, or yeah. in oceans. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. We, the humans also need uh, several minerals in our bodies that support our muscles, cell functions, our brain functions, everything, literally everything. And is it true that these minerals also come from the soil? Indeed. The soil comes from weathering or breaking down of the parent rock, deep down in the soil very far, some, some rocks are very far, but over millions of the years they have weathered and they have formed what we call soil. And by definition, if you go to the, the, the soil science society group definition of a soil, is a very thin blanket, about 40 centimeters, just about a foot that covers the whole world. Imagine a blanket rolled all over the earth, 40 centimeters thick. That's all we have. That's wow. all that we were given to feed us. Below the rocks, different rocks, they have also very many all over the world. They weather, they break down, and they give rise to a soil with elements, these minerals that we take. The minerals are essential and they taken up by crops. In fact, from the way we train, each plant requires 16 essential elements plus others, which come from the soil. It is as a result of the plant taking up nutrients from the soil, accumulating them in their own parts that we end up getting them. If we were told to go eat soil and get the elements, we'd be shocked, we wouldn't. If we talk about supplementation, yes, it's okay with those people who are endowed and are able to acquire them. But remember, billions of human beings on earth will not afford this supplement. Mm -hmm. So the plant does everything. The, the rock weathers, forms the soil. The soil has those elements that are readily available. The plant has to suck them and put them in their own structure. And as we are eating, either fresh or cooked, we end up having those elements as recommended, as required by our bodies. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and the animals, because the healthier the animals, of course, for those who eat meat. Um, Precisely, all living things. 
all living things. Even the single cell I talked about exactly. requires the same elements and they get them from the soil solution. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And one of we, this episode is more focused on food, and but oh, we should not forget also the fibers of cotton or everything that warms our skin. You mentioned earlier the blanket of the soil. I like that um, metaphor. But the blankets that warm us were also a plant at some point yeah. in yeah. the soil, and also also got that those minerals and um, substances into them. Yeah. I, th I think it's very important to always remember where the sustainable development goals have placed the soil. Yeah. It is an appreciated resource that has quite a number of su sustainable development goals that we have to achieve. And actually they guide us and ensure that we respect this natural resource mm -hmm. because without it, we may not attain some of those goals. In the, particularly in the developing world, we may not. Yeah, so we have to nurture this. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, of course yes, and it's we, we see why it's so important that these goals, that soil is simply one of the major goals. Uh, we see its importance, and we'll discuss this a little in a little bit more detail in just a moment, because we are facing challenges. This year has been a year of challenges on so many levels, and uh, some of these challenges experts say like the catastrophic flooding in Germany and China is also linked with false management of our land. What are we doing wrong Nancy and what needs to be done to rectify this? Uh, flooding could be one is the issue of mismanagement of the land cover. I've talked about this blanket. It's an interesting blanket that came up with its own cover. That is the vegetation. Yes. Which binds, upon weathering, the soil becomes loose. And if it doesn't have a cover, many a time is susceptible to disturbance. It could be physical disturbance that is moving around, digging, construction, putting structures. But particularly from my point of view in the developing world from Kenya, removal of vegetation, keeping too many animals, mm -hmm. urbanization where we are cutting big tracts of land and putting up houses and maybe not going back to stabilize. Infrastructure, the roads, especially in the developing, developed world, there's a lot of roads going on, all kinds of, yeah. So this, are the consequences that are bringing about flooding. Of course, also there's climate change where the, the, the systems and the, of the, the rainfall, the amounts, the rates at which they are coming. It's also impacting because before we could see a, a rainy season that will prolong for a long time. Now we are having storms that come in two days a day. You find like in China recently, you get a meter of rainfall in two days you, the, the, the soil cannot soak that, cannot take that. The, the rate at which water gets into the soil, we call it infiltration, becomes is slower than the amount of water that is coming in from, from above. And therefore it tends to go, to, 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 to go on the land, to, mm -hmm. to float and run on the land, whereby it also causes a lot of damage. So there's a, the, the result of the changes in the rainfall the, 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 the way they are coming, the storms. And also, by the way, sometimes they may follow a very dry season time when most of the cover has dried up. So climate change, but also the human impact is, yeah. is, a, is a big, big driver of what yeah. we, are, we are seeing. Yeah. yeah. In German sub experts were saying that uh, because of us, as you said, every uh, it's a, a diversified, very diversified world under the surface. I mean, this blanket that you were talking about, this 40 centimeters blanket. And if we kill these helpers, of course, the soil loses its quality and it becomes, uh, becomes harder. And if we have this in combination with a higher downpour, the, the flooding simply uh, uh, goes off. And uh, I mean, the water simply rolls off. And of course, faster floods faster into the rivers, which cannot support um, all that. 
And yeah, but also if, if you consult an engineer, you learn that water has a lot of energy. Yes. Yeah. Once it is running, it will do a lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah, I lived, I lived in, a, in the Rhine the region called Rheingau in Germany, right along the Rhine River. And every few years we had really severe floodings. It was something normal, something that these little villages along the Rhine expected. And I remember going one time closer to the river after one of those floodings and it's this incredible power in this, in this incredible force in this river. Yeah. Makes you, I don't know, it makes you, understand how strong it is and how insignificant we humans are in our <laughs> our dwelling yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean the damage we saw in germany even last this week or last week in turkey the vehicles are carried and squeezed in a path and i mean yeah, you yeah. can't imagine what what the kind of force that yeah exactly so water is very powerful and that is why Basically, with the question you're asking, how do we respect Mother Earth? Exactly. Because these are the, the indicators you are being told you have not been good stewards. Mm -hmm. You've got to do something and change. Yeah. Uh, for us, um, many also argue that monocultures are not sustainable in long term. And uh, we had in our first episode, our first guest was uh, Galia Orme from uh, Chokchik, and we discussed cacao. And in this episode, we discussed how plants like to, to grow in, in a symbiosis, uh, how, for example, a cacao plants like the, the shadow of, the, of other plants. And um, so there is a recent trend towards more diversity in agriculture. And the benefit of this is that uh, it also brings a diversified income for farmers because they're not selling only one crop, they can now sell several things. What are your thoughts on monocultures? Uh, I'm coming from Africa where the, in, the, the, the farming practices before the, 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 the commercialization farming came in, uh, it was mixed farming. Mm -hmm. And in any typical African farm you go, you, you seldom find one crop in a plot of land. Many a time you find four, five, six different types of crops. Of course, as you have mentioned, they bring about an assurance of food security mm -hmm. because these crops, they are different. They grow at different times. They bring diversity on the, food, on the plate. So you find the farmer will have a starch, a protein, a vegetable, and they are picked from the farm because we are, we are coming from a background of non-commercialized farms. Then we came out and we brought out the commercialization of our farming systems. Just give me a minute. <coughs> what I'm saying is, the, the African farmer is a mixed farmer in terms of the crops, the farms in one piece of land, you find diverse diversification in terms of there are many crops. And these crops, the way they are grown, one, they mature at different stages. You find that on that farm is a complete plate. It has a stretch, it has a, a, a vegetable, it may have a legume, which is a protein source, you'll be surprised there is also fruit at many a time. So it is an assurance of food security, a balanced diet, and it could also be a commercial setup within the same. But as, as we move towards urbanization, because let me put it, I think it's urbanization, especially in Africa that is making us go commercial. The need also for money to buy other things as the world changes towards preferences, consumer preferences, then you find a lot of farms are getting towards monocropping. Mm -hmm. Do I think that's the right thing? As an agriculturist, I don't think it is. Because I talked about diversity below the ground. There's a lot of, in fact, the, we, the way we approach as agriculturists is that what I grow on the surface influences what is below the ground. And 
that symbiotic relationship goes hand in hand with a stable earth. Mm -hmm. With actually, in fact, management of climate. And the way you, if you visit an African farmer, you find the early, the way crops grow, some are below, some are above, some are shedding others. And then from the scientific point of view, these organisms below the ground many a time have symbiotic relationship. I'll give an example. I am more interested in legumes because legumes have been given something very special. They are nit nitrogen fixing or they are small micro factories that make nitrogen fertilizer in their roots. The way they do it is that they are in symbiotic or in a friendship with some bacteria that go into their roots. And through some mechanism, they are able to fix nitrogen or get nitrogen from the atmosphere and transform it into nitrogen fertilizer. Held in their roots, when these plants die, they actually increase nitrogen and feed the accompanying crop, like the maize, the wheat, the barley, all these grasses that we grow. Mm -hmm. And you find that if you manage that system nicely, use the root, use the top, you don't have to add chemical fertilizer. In the same token, as you raise the fertility of the soil, you find now you encourage other organisms to increase in the soil. A legume, a, 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 a grass or maize plant is very heavy on roots. May actually be having very beautiful symbiotic relationship with a fungi. That fungi will help it acquire more phosphorus from the soil. So you can see the complementality of the crops below the ground comes up on the surface as well. When you now remove the bean and you just do wheat, you actually, all these organisms that you are associating with the legumes or any other crop, sometimes the populations tend to go down or they may disappear. The only thing, if you remember from my beginning of the talk, is that the diversity is so big, we may not notice we are losing it in the yeah. soil. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way they are created is very interesting. Some, in fact, is that if I lose one species and it disappears completely from the face of the earth, there's another one that comes and complements the activity. Mm -hmm. But how many are we going to lose before we detect there is a problem? And before Indeed, we break, I must, yeah, we break, in fact, I must tell you, yeah, we are already noticing a problem in the soil through loss of some biodiversity. Yeah. I may actually have a chance to give you an example, but I think remember the beauty is that below above ground influences what is below the ground and that these organisms, the way they are created depend on each other. And that if we, we, we put these crops together, several diversity on the, on the same, we favor better productivity sustainability and stability mm -hmm. of the soil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All of the uh, factors we mentioned earlier, how to keep, how, how to keep water, how to uh, support the, the living beings underneath who like this ecosystem, and of course, the best conditions for our food. And you mentioned a very important work, uh, word uh, a, a, a moment ago, and that is um, the move towards urbanization. When we talk about urbanization, we normally think of Asia because a lot of urbanization happened here in Asia and is still happening, but the future of urbanization is actually in Africa with some of the fastest growing cities happening, uh, being on your continent. So in your opinion, um, how can we connect better the urban dwellers and the farmers and how can we feed them better? Because we, we won't stop this trend but I worry about our food security as urban dwellers. Uh, urbanization in the African continent is ticking, is, 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 is ticking up, it's too fast. Yeah. And it is not going alongside the planned urbanization. So basically what I'm saying is, you find that 60% or more of urban, 
urbanites or urban residents live in informal and planned settlements. What does that mean? These people, if you have a, a four million, a population of four million in a in a in a in a, in a city, you find like fifty percent are not even taken care of because they are nowhere in urban planning. They are nowhere in any of the government uh, plannings. So they come and just pitch things all over the place. They lack infrastructure. They lack everything that I may call anything. And in fact, one challenge, even when you think about production of your own food or producing your own food in a bad setup, it is a big problem because there's no land allocated or planned for urban agriculture. There are no policies that are existing that actually take care of these farms because we still are guided by, if you may allow me to use our colonial plannings, we are, we are, we are just adjusting. And the planning then had nothing to do with food production in urban areas. The, the unfortunate thing and the major problem is that most of the migrants to the urban areas are moving because of other challenges from the rural areas, lack of employment. Yes. Some places, the population even in the rural areas are exploding, so people have to move. There's a lot of insecurity and conflict. So people are shifting because of other forces. It's not that they are planned. It's not that it just happened because there are crises in some areas. So when they come, there's a lot of frustration and you are coming to a place that is not prepared for you. So food insecurity is real. Malnutrition is real, plus many, many other challenges in urban areas. Yeah. How can it be sorted out? One thing is, Food, in the, the fact that there is food insecurity in urban area does in, in the informal, particularly in the formal, informal settlement, is, is, is not that there's no food. Some countries where there's that have a lot of food. So the accessibility of food, poor infrastructure, not only in the urban areas where they are, but in, even in the rural areas where the food is coming from. Two, transportation costs. You find accessibility of food because they cannot afford. There's very high unemployment in their informal settlements of many of the African urban areas. So these people, there is food. It is not, they, can, they may not be able to afford it. Thirdly, which is even worse, is the, the availability, accessibility of food in these informal settlements because there are no markets, there is no infrastructure. So even to get that food within the urban area into the residential informal settlement also is a big thing. And that also adds to the cost because whoever is taking food there is struggling to get it from the main market or city market to where they are. So there are many challenges. And I don't know whether urban agriculture is the solution. I, I, I know I have struggled with this thing for a long, long time. And I feel it is up to our governments to work out and solve small things like infrastructure, markets, and also the packaging of the foods as they come from the rural areas. Yeah. Are they properly packaged? Finally, let me comment. The world is not hungry. The world is wasting. 60% of uh, the fresh produce, or let me put it a little bit to be, be fair, 50% of the, uh, the fresh produce in most most countries in the world is lost, post-harvest losses. If you think about grains, we lose like 30%. If only we could save half of what we are wasting, then I think we would capture and solve the problem of food availability and accessibility. Yes, you're mentioning, Nancy, you're mentioning a very crucial point. It's exactly the center of my question. And this is the biggest irony of our time. As you said, rightfully said, uh, uh, we will waste in, uh, in the developed Western world, we will waste 60% of food because 30% during the harvest and the other one later on uh, in, uh, in the, uh, either on our tables or before it reaches our tables. So the biggest irony is that uh, almost 1 billion people will go to bed hungry tonight. Yet at the same time, we waste 60, 60%. 60 
how can we how can we manage this? Do you have a have you and your team researched in this area? How can we um, how can we change the infrastructure? Infrastructure is another important term that you mentioned, and I I, I dedicate quite a bit of time to that in in my research work. Um, how can we adjust the infrastructure uh, to uh, to direct the food? properly on this beautiful planet of ours. You know, I struggle with the, the, the direction of research and innovation and investment in food industry, or in, from processing to everything. But I, as, you are, as, as we are discussing, I've always wondered, why aren't we investing in food preservation, in food reprocessing and repackaging in such a way that it can actually reach more people. How can we change our attitudes and our, our practices so that we just buy and eat what we want, not store too much? How can, but because it, it's a very complex, but uh, I think we need to put in more effort, not in just producing and enhancing yield. And uh, can we think more of the storage and as you have put it, on distribution. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's, there's a challenge there. I've mentioned within the same country, within the same city, you find heaps of food rotting in a developing world, yet a kilometer away or even next door, there's a street person who's dying and there's food rotting here. I think these are the challenges that we have and we have to sort them out very quickly. I don't have a solution to this. It's very difficult for me to solve it unless we think through all, we come up with a solution. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very unfortunate that the billions of people are hungry, a billion people, those are very many. That's a, that's a lot but, of, uh, yeah, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of fellow human beings um, that uh, don't those have, are very many. don't come into this, into this benefit. And the other, the other issue is how can we support more the local solutions? Because in the past, we applied the same solutions to, uh, to uh, everywhere. We applied the same uh, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, herbicides, fungicides worldwide. And thinking, oh, if it helped in the States or it helped in Germany, it must be good for Kenya, it must be good for South Africa, it must be good for Vietnam, it does not matter. How can we... Um, better uh, support the local solutions because, as you said, uh, Kenya or in every country has a long tradition in growing food. We there is nothing new to this. We have been growing food for fifteen thousand years. Some archaeologists suggest, and since we started to settle down and start a farm, a start a, a start a village. So. How can we, how can we, for example, in your case, uh, the, the local Nairobi knowledge, um, how can we support uh, that old knowledge and implement it into the, into the food growth or soil management? One thing is uh, we are at a crossroad because we, we, I don't know how it is, but most likely even the Western world is the same. We have lost the traditional production system. In fact, the other day, I think I was reading a book in Italy where they are arguing about loss of the diets, the old diets, the way they prepare their pasta and whatever, it, it's going away. It's the same case here. When the maize was brought here 50 years ago, it replaced our traditional cereals. And therefore, when you come to this country, when there's a shortage of maize, people say we are hungry. We've been forced to take maize to grow in areas that it should not and it doesn't. So we have crop failures year in, year out. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we removed cassava. We removed yam. We removed millet that traditionally and historically was the main source of food. And you take something that doesn't, doesn't survive. So how do we go back to those productions, traditional production systems at a time when those who knew uh, are out? 
yeah. the young generation is not even farming. That, that's, that it's, it's a very critical time. We have no choice, but somehow we have to go back. The only fear we have is that we, are, we want to go back to traditions that were working when populations were low, when there were less amounts to feed. So we are scared and worried that if we start going back there, we, we are going to compromise the demand, the yield, and we may not produce enough. But on the other hand, we are destroying the resource that supports food production. And that's why you see now we are running away to aeroponics, hydroponics. Yes. But you see, there are some crops that cannot be produced from aeroponics and hydroponics. We can't produce wheat from hydroponics to feed the earth. We can grow lettuce. We can grow tomatoes. But the main step of food on, in, the, in the world is cereals. I mean, yeah. the, the, the starch yeah. is the energy, the driver of our populations and energy for you to and me to talk and to move. So uh, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we must go back if we have to get to the sustainable food production systems for the future generations. Fertilizers are okay if used together. In fact, we talk of integrated nutrient management in soil science. We don't want just fertilizer, fertilizer. Yeah, exactly. But, but for your information, any Africa is not using fertilizer. Mm. We use very little. Yeah, we use very good. little. Yeah, the, the problem is we do not add anything. We are not using organic because in the olden days, they used to return everything. Now we are removing. So what we do in Africa is nutrient mining. In the Western world, it's the opposite. It's poisoning of the soil because they're adding a lot. In Africa, we are killing by removing, removing. It's like having a bucket of water and every time you are removing, but you are not opening the tap to add. So finally you find the bucket has no water. Okay, okay, interesting. That's a different, a different approach to it. Yes, uh, we have to, I mean, considering that farming has such a, a huge influence of our own health, we have to value farmers again because we unfortunately don't do that. And the young people, of course, uh, go for jobs and for, uh, for vocations that are valued, that are, for the absence of a better word, sexy. And mm. so we have, to, we have to give appreciation. And there are some statistics in Italy or United States, some areas, some, some states of, within the United States, there's a growing trend of farmers uh, actually young people become farmers because they want to take this into their own hands and we should support that trend because it's extremely important for them and for us. So um, maybe that's one of the ways to make it more appealing to young Kenyans. No, they, we, um, I didn't say they are not there, they are there, but they are commercial and they're using the new production systems yes because the, the your concern was how do we go back to the traditional that yes. ensure sustainability them they are ready to go in fact young people want direct and quick answers isn't it but this working through and restoring systems or making sure that the way they are they don't go back they may not unless the value of the product is pegged mm -hmm. to yeah. the efforts that you have made so that there is some, some incentives. Currently in Africa, when you talk something like organic farming, we don't, we don't have that, the incentives and the special pricing and the grading. When they, run, they are in the market, they're almost the same as the conventionally produced food. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying we have young people, but they want quick money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's what we have to support, maybe, and and get and get somehow the wisdom of the elders paired with uh, together with young yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that will be the way pass forward. It has been as I thought. Uh, it has been a very enlightening conversation with you, Nancy. How can we, how can my listeners find, I'm sure that they're curious about you now as well. Where can my listeners find you? How can they get in touch with you? How can we support your work? For me, I'm not on social media. 
I'm only on email, okay. WhatsApp, and the telephone. Okay, so they, they, can, uh, they I, can Google you like I did. <laughs> they'll Google me, they'll get me. I am, yeah, I, I am all over the place. I am one of the few soil biologists in Africa. So, and I internationally, I have a lot of huge networks in many countries in the world. So they will, they will find me. I, I find it a bit taxing to go on social media for me. Yeah, that's and no I problem. Get, I don't know that I'll cope. Yeah, yeah. That's no problem. So, yeah. was, so that is a way to get me. Yes. As to how to help me, I don't know. I'm a researcher. I'm always looking for partners. So if, if anybody is interested in partnership, looking for partners in Africa on soil or agricultural production systems, sustainable production systems in Africa. I am very keen because it's through that as researchers, we have to mobilize resources and it's becoming very difficult as I know my colleagues in science know how difficult it is right now. Globally, it is very difficult to look for money, but that is my major interest. I have, I have worked and partnered with many people in Africa and in many countries, including particularly in Europe and the America. So, yeah. I think mine is, if you are interested and in looking for partnership, just get hold of me. I will even put together a partnership in Africa because I have, I have quite a lot of friends in Africa. Very good, very good. That's very, very good. I'm, I'm glad, uh, um, I'm uh, sure my listeners will, uh, will look you up. Thank you so much for joining today, Nancy. That has been a beautiful conversation. Uh, very, very nice, good. nice. Yeah, nice talking to you, Dana. I'm happy to meet you. I hope one day you come to Africa. Now you know you have my contacts. If you're passing through Africa, I do. Through Nairobi, so. yeah, just get hold of me. When this pandemic is over, yes, make exactly. a trip to Africa. Exactly, because Kenya is yeah. definitely on my list. I would love to see your beautiful country. Oh, you're yeah. very welcome. It's very beautiful. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know. Thank I you know. so much. It's so beautiful pictures. Yes, I would love to visit one day. Um, Thank you, thank you again. And in conclusion, dear listeners, I have one more thought to share with you. Has it ever occurred to you that every single stalk of corn, every single blade of wheat, every single rice plant was placed into soil as a seed? These little seeds now nourish our bodies. I am sure you have reflected on this before. But perhaps what you have not considered as the soil and the quality of soil in Kenya, Brazil, Mexico, United States, or any other country influences your nutritional well-being on the other side of the world. Clearly everything is connected and that's why we have to understand better this connection of our mother earth. And today's episode showed you how life above and below the surface is connected. This completes today's conversations with Mother Earth episode on soil. Next week, we will again take a look at life itself, but from a more poetic perspective. Stay tuned.